Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Anna Summers, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar will be um, on May. Um, it's going to be in May. I, um, we're changing on how we're going to be doing our graphics. So um, I have not made the May calendar yet, but there will be a great webinar with James Tanner. Um, and if you would like to access the previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Catherine Grant, who will be giving a presentation on, that's not right. <laughs> I could have sworn I made a new one. Um, the one I'm seeing on the screen is right, Anna, helping others is. to learn and do family history. At least that's what I prepared. <laughs> yeah. Um, but on the on the right, I know I updated it on Photoshop, but um, it says it's last week's or two weeks. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, weird. Anyways, but it's yeah, helping others learn to love and do family history with Catherine Grant, which I'm so excited for. Um, and so Catherine, um, after you saw the lens, began doing family history. Somewhat to her surprise, she discovered that she loved it. Her specialty is helping new family historians find success, maybe even avoid some of the mistakes she's made. Catherine teaches Sunday classes at the BYU Family History Library and presents at other family history events. Her column on family history ran in the Nauvoo Times for about a year and is still available online. In addition, she's a regular contributor to the Family Search blog. Catherine works as a technical writer and instructional designer with a focus on usability and process improvement. Her current work assignments include developing training used on mobile devices. Besides family history, she loves uplifting music, thought-provoking books in springtime. Catherine, if you're ready, we'll turn the time to you. Great. Thank you, Anna. And I just saw what you were talking about. on the. I was looking on the right-hand side, which, or excuse me, the left side, which had my correct webinar, but you were talking about the right side, right? Yeah, yeah I'm okay. so sorry. Oh, no, that not a problem at all. I'm sorry I was confused. So <laughs> let's go ahead and share the screen. And here we go. So the screen should be visible to everybody. Let me know if it's not. But you guys, I am so excited to be with you today to talk about this important topic, helping others to learn to love and do family history. My guess is that you're attending this webinar or watching the recording because this is a topic that matters to you. You probably have been helping people to do family history. And so, if that's the case, you're probably familiar with this challenge. So you love family history and you're so excited about it and you wish that other people felt the same way. So you try to engage them, but you're met with a variety of different reactions. Some people run as fast as they can the other direction. I had this experience once when teaching a class at church, actually, on family history. Somebody accidentally stumbled into the classroom, and as soon as they found out what the topic was, you should have seen them hightail it out of that room as fast as they could. Some people just yawn when you mention family history. You can tell that they, they are convinced that it's going to be boring and most of the time they haven't tried it, but that's just what they expect or what they have heard and so they actually don't really give it a chance. Then there are those who have tried it and have had bad experiences. Maybe they've come up against a brick wall or whatever it may be. They tried to use family search and they found it confusing and didn't know what, what they were doing or what they were looking at. And so their frustration level keeps them from wanting to be involved. And then we have the golden people that just learn to love family history and they enjoy it as much as we do and they're eager to learn. 
Well, the purpose of this webinar is to increase the number of people who have this reaction, the happy, positive, I want to learn reaction, as opposed to some of the other reactions that we might experience. So here's a quick overview, very simple uh, topics that we're going to be talking about today in class. First of all, as far as teaching others about family history, we're going to take a few minutes to review things that don't work so well and why. And you might be saying, well, why do I want to know what doesn't work? What I found is that if you know what doesn't work, then you can avoid doing those things and you can focus on things that actually do work, which is the second part of our webinar, things that work better than the things that don't work so well. And we will be teaching both principles and giving practical ideas. So things that don't work so well and why. This one will not surprise you at all. Guilt does not work. I think people are avoiding guilt a lot more today than they have maybe in decades past. I remember when I was younger, guilt was kind of a, considered to be a motivating thing. If you could, um, the assumption was if you could make few people feel bad enough about ignoring family history, then they would start to do it. Well, Guilt kind of tends to backfire, as probably all of us know. It can be a short-term motivator, but the key word there is short-term. And in the end, it's more likely to elicit resentment and resistance. Now, you might be saying, I don't guilt people. And hopefully all of us, I'm sure none of us do it on purpose, right? But I, there's been times when I've been talking with people, not necessarily about family history, but I say something that they don't agree with. And you can just tell there's that like reaction where they they make it clear in their facial expression and body language that they think I'm kind of heading down the wrong path. So I don't know if you'd call that passive aggressive guilt or whatever. And the thing is, I think it's a human thing. Sometimes we just fall into it without realizing it. So all of us, I'm sure, try to avoid guilt, but maybe we can look and see if there's anything in our reactions when we're talking to people that would maybe, even if we don't intend it, would make them feel a measure of guilt, which would just push them away. So guilt is not a good way to help people learn to love and do family history. Now, this one, when I discovered it, really surprised me. So you will so often hear people say, you've got to motivate people to do family history. If you just motivate them, if you just give them inspirational quotes or let them see how important it is, tell them a heart tugging story, then they're going to want to do family history. Well, what happens in real life is that it does inspire people initially. I remember attending a conference where somebody just told a tearjerker of a story about you know, people getting involved in family history. And I had tears in my eyes and, and it was very moving. But the trouble with that approach is that, especially for new people, novices to family history, it's very difficult to translate that feeling of motivation into action. It's like, imagine that you wanted to be a doctor. You wanted to study to be a doctor. And so you went to a seminar, uh, maybe given by a doctor to prospective college students who may want to pursue medicine as a career. The doctor gets up there and just says, what a wonderful experience she's had being a doctor and she loves serving people it's her calling in life it's so amazing and everybody leaves there thinking yes this is what I want to do with my life but she forgot to tell them okay now here's how you actually submit your application or here are the prerequisites or whatever so people leave feeling very fired up and very motivated, but without the tools to take the next step. And what happens is that that can actually result in discouragement. And I found this out a little bit the hard way as a, an early teacher at the BYU FHL about oh, 10 years ago when I first started. I think it was around 2012, 2015. 14 or something. And I was new to this teaching family history stuff. 
and I thought, okay, I'm going to motivate my class members today. And so I prepared this nifty slide deck with all these encouraging, motivating things. And I spent quite a bit of time sharing inspirational quotes and stuff. Well, as some of you may know, if you've attended my other classes uh, on Sundays, especially, I will give out a survey at the end asking for suggestions for improvement. Well, one of the class members, and later I found that other people agreed with him, said, you know, I didn't come to your class to be motivated. I am already here because I want to do family history. I need to know how. And I was, that was an epiphany for me, honestly. I think I had fallen into the false assumption that most people don't do family history because they lack motivation. What I found usually is that they lack time and they lack the skills. That's really why they don't do family history. Now, motivation can be helpful, but I look at it as similar to spice in a recipe. A little bit goes a long way. So a short motivating um, quote or something can definitely be inspiring, but follow that up with giving people the skills that they need to actually move forward with their family history. Next thing is lengthy or non-practical instruction. And by non-practical, I mean that it's not something people can really use. Maybe it stays in the theoretical or the general realm, but people get out of the class and they go, okay, I understood the words that you said, but I do not know how to apply it. And long instruction, I've mentioned this to in other classes. Some of you may remember this. I was cleaning out my mom's home, moving her to a smaller place, and I came across a family history training manual for a class that I'm guessing she had taken at some point, and it was two years long. That's overwhelming, right? So lengthy instruction can just be overwhelming and people are not going to want to make the commitment in many cases, or they'll feel that they can't with everything that's already going on in their lives. Nowadays, even a few hours can seem like a long time, right? Depending on what the person wants to learn and so forth. So overwhelming instruction is not going to be successful. And also, if it's too long or if it's not applicable, frankly, it's going to be boring to most people. So we need to make sure that our instruction is concise and that it's applicable, that it's something useful for people. And we'll be getting into that a little bit later on. I think partly in response to decades of too long or too theoretical instruction, in the last, I don't know, five, 10 years or so, I've seen people start to take a different approach, which I would call a random approach. Here's an example. Uh, a friend of mine went into a family history center to get some help, and the person just said, hey, sit down, here's how you sign on to family tree, family search family tree, and just play around and see what happens, see what you find. The trouble with that is that often it can lead, especially in the shared family tree, it can lead to serious mistakes because a beginner can get in there and just say, oh, possible duplicate? Sure, let's merge it and see what happens or I'll click on that and see what happens. And because nobody has taught them the ropes or maybe told them some of the pitfalls to avoid, they've been led to believe they can just get in and do whatever, so they do. And it's not until much later that they discover that maybe they've made some serious mistakes that will be difficult to undo. Also, the random approach does not build the skills that people need, and it doesn't invite long-term involvement. I've heard of some people having an approach where they will just say, hey, let's do a search for somebody in your family tree and just see what we find. That can be a good approach if it's followed up with skill building and, you know, where do we go from here? But if all we do is search for a random name, people will be like, okay, that's really nice. And then they don't know where to go from there. So random does not work nearly well as intentional. 
And then finally, honestly, one of my biggest concerns in the family history space, again, I think in response to these years of, of you know, decades of difficult training or people saying, oh, you forgot the comma in your source and you're a bad person because you didn't punctuate your source correctly. You know, there's that end of the spectrum where we're probably too honed in on details that really maybe don't matter. But then people have gone to the opposite extreme of oversimplifying, of making things look easier than they really are, or teaching people to cut corners. This approach tends to be based on some false assumptions. One is that people are stupid and that they're incapable of learning. A person who uh, espouses this view might not phrase it quite that way, but as I've talked with people who espouse this view, that kind of comes through where their, their, their underlying assumption is that people are not capable or not willing to learn. And I'll tell you, as a teacher, I have found the exact opposite. Most people really do want to learn and they really do want to do a good job. Another false assumption that that is kind of behind this dumbing things down is, oh shoot, it just went out of my head. Give me just a second. Oh, it's out of my head. I will come back to it. The, the Zoom that we're using doesn't allow me to see my speaker notes. So, um, We'll just go with that other false assumption for now. But this is another thing that leads to serious mistakes. So when we teach people that things are easier than they are, for instance, I have heard people say things like, oh, research is not required anymore. You don't need to do that. You can, things are so simple now, the computer will do your thinking for you. And when people believe that, then it leads to serious mistakes. And um, in a shared tree and family tree, that can be a significant problem because the things that we contribute to family tree affect other users. And finally, oh, oh, this is the other false assumption. It just came back to me with point number three. The false assumption is that Ordinary people do not want to learn to do family history accurately because it's, quote, too hard. Therefore, if you dumb it down or make it look simpler than it is, then eventually they'll get into it and they'll realize that they weren't told the whole story and they will learn how to do things correctly. What I've actually found in, in practice, in real life, people feel like they've been betrayed. They feel like they've been the victim of a bait and switch, that someone has set expectations low and then comes in and says, oh, just kidding. It's actually harder than you think it is. Let me share an experience that one of my friends had. She's a, a temple and family history consultant for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Idaho. And this didn't happen to her personally because she's not that kind of teacher, but it happened to somebody else that she became aware of. So somebody had been told, you know, just get into family tree and do whatever. Family history is so easy nowadays, you can't go wrong. Just get in there and play around and do whatever you feel like doing. So this woman did that and she actually made some serious mistakes. A cousin of hers contacted her and said, uh, did you know that you've kind of really messed some things up here and and I don't know if they were tactful or not tactful or whatever I wasn't privy to that exchange but they basically the cousin communicated to the person that they had kind of messed things up the reaction of the person wasn't oh good now I'd like to learn how to do it right since I was misled before instead the person was so embarrassed and so frustrated and she said I am never doing family history again that's a more likely result of dumbing things down or cutting corners, making things look easier than they really are. In other words, misleading people. That is just never a good idea. So if these things don't work, why do we do them? Why do we see them around us? I will tell you that I don't believe most people do them maliciously or intentionally trying to cause damage. Most people, that's not their desire. They really want to do what's right. They really want to help other people. But 
those things that we just talked about, frankly, they're a lot easier than teaching people to do family history accurately. And they're faster. You can send people on a guilt trip in two seconds, whereas it's a lot harder to teach them to love family history the right way, which we're going to be talking about later on. Also, often we don't think about the long term results. We see that short term result. Oh, good. They signed on the family tree and they've been playing around, but we don't stop to think, oh, now what? What what's going to be the next step for them? Do they even know what the next step is to take? And then finally, Frankly, a lot of times we just plain don't know what else to do. We've seen other people use these approaches. We, uh, from what we can tell, they think these approaches are fine. So I guess that's what people are doing. I guess that's what I'll do too, because I don't know what else to do. So hopefully in this webinar, we'll talk about some alternatives that will at least give you options of ways that I believe are truly more effective to help people learn to love and do family history. So that um, brings us to the next section. If all those things don't work, what does? Let's take a look. So things that work better. One thing I think is so important to remember when we help others with family history, our role really is that of teachers. We're not doing their family history for them. In um, the case of helping someone learn to love and do family history, they haven't hired us as a professional researcher, so we're not doing it for them. We don't just demo while they watch. We're not, that's not a good way to learn in most cases. Usually it's much more effective to actually do it ourselves rather than watch somebody. An initial demo can be helpful. I'm not saying that demos are never helpful, but if that's all we do, if all we do is demonstrate, it's probably not going to help people build their skills. And then finally, we're not just showing them what to click. It's got to go deeper than that. We want to create family history learning experiences that have these three aspects. First of all, we want them to meet the goals and needs of the person that we're helping. Second, we want to build competence. And third, we want to delight and inspire them. We want the experience to be joyful. We want it to be the kind of thing that they want to come back to again and again. So let's talk about each of those three things. First of all, meeting goals and needs. If did any of you think, well, that sounds so obvious. And I agree, it does. But sometimes the obvious things are still the things that we skip over, or we assume that we already know it when we really don't. So to meet someone's goals and needs, you have to know what they are, and you can't just assume. You can't assume that they're the same as yours. I've been surprised sometimes talking to people about their goals and needs. Here's an example. There was a woman who asked for my help in family history. And so I thought, oh, yeah, she's probably going to want help building her family tree, finding names to add to the tree or whatever. I was surprised. I said, Julie, what is your important goal? What would you like to accomplish when we spend some time together working on your family history? And she said, I am new to family search. I've had relatives try to explain it to me, but they just zoomed so fast through it that I could not even follow what they were doing. I'm not comfortable working in the system. This is the kind of person, this is how her brain worked. She said, I'm not comfortable working in the system until at least I have a basic understanding of how it works. So we did for our little uh, discovery session together, we did Family Search 101. I just explained to her where the data came from in Family Search, the basics of navigation, the basics of editing information, and it was exactly what she wanted. And when the, we got to the end, she said, thank you so much. Now I finally get it. Now I feel more confident that I can get into Family Search and I can do what I need to do. So that leads to how do we find out people's goals? Really, the most effective way is to ask them. Now, that's for a personalized experience. And personalized experiences are really one of the most effective ways. 
but not every experience is personalized. This webinar is a good example. So if you're teaching a class and you can't really pull all the students ahead of time and ask them what their goals and needs are, sometimes you have to make some assumptions and you have to make some observations. And so that's actually what I did in this case. I noticed that a lot of people were struggling with how to teach others to do family history. So it was my observations that led me to the topic for this webinar. And for those people who um, have these needs and goals, then hopefully this webinar would be beneficial to them. So then the other tricky part where often we we let goals and needs fall off the radar is actually during the learning experience. We kind of we we may ask people their goals and then we forget to design an experience to meet their goals and instead we design it to meet our goals. So it's so important to let the other person's goals and needs drive the learning experience and we'll actually give an example of this later on. Okay, that's about meeting goals and needs of the person that you're helping. The next thing is building competence. So this flies in the face of the last item that I mentioned, right, the last way not to teach of dumbing things down or cutting corners. This, I just feel that this is so important. So how important is it to build competence in the people that we're helping? Well, I just ran across this wonderful quote the other day in a podcast by a gentleman named McKay Christensen. The podcast is called Open Your Eyes. You can actually Google it, and I've got the, the link here if anybody's interested. This comes from episode 16 in season one, and he said, one of the most basic sources of personal power is competence. In other words, feeling like we've got the tools and the ability to do what we want to do. Continuing, that was my interjection, now continuing the quote. When people feel that they have the skills needed for success, they are more likely to take action that will help them achieve their goals. So usually, as I mentioned earlier, in my experience, the problem isn't that people aren't motivated. They don't lack motivation most of the time. Instead, they lack the competence. They, they, their gut feeling is that they don't have the necessary skills. So that's how we can help people get more motivated and more involved in family history is to help them become competent. So how do we build competence? Let's look at a few suggestions. Again, I'll bring this back. I can't emphasize this enough, the importance of centering the learning experience on the person's goals. Let me share with you just a wonderful experience that I think illustrates this. This was shared by Dieter F. Uchtdorf, who is a leader in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He's an apostle. And he told a compelling story about when he was younger, he actually was a war refugee from World War II with his family. And for a while, they lived in Russian-occupied East Germany. Well, when young Dieter Uchtdorf went to school, he grew up speaking German, or at the time he was, you know, moved with the war, I believe German was his native language. But when he went to school, because it was in Russian occupied East Germany, he had to learn Russian in school. Well, that was hard. Um, this Cyrillic alphabet is different. The sounds are different. Um, fortunately, young children are pretty adept at picking up languages. So he did do pretty well at Russian eventually after a lot of persistence and hard work. Then his family moved to West Germany, which at the time was occupied by, occupied by American forces, and he had to learn English. Now he'd already learned, he already knew German, he'd already learned Russian, and now he's being asked to learn a third language. And I've been told by people that study languages that English is one of the three hardest languages to learn, the other being Chinese and Finnish, according to what I was told. Now, I'm sure there could be different takes on this. So just the point I'm trying to make is English is a really hard language for a non-English speaker to learn. So young Dieter Uchtdorf is in school and he is just struggling. 
English. He, he later was to say, I thought my mouth was not made for speaking English. That's how hard it was. But young Dieter Uchtdorf, as many of you probably know, had a dream, and that was to be an aviator. He wanted to fly airplanes. He, after school, he would go down to the local airfield, and he would watch those airplanes landing and taking off, and he would say to himself, I'm going to fly those airplanes someday. I am going to be a pilot. And that was just his passion. He knew that's what he wanted to do. Well, as he looked more into it, he made an interesting discovery. Pilots have to speak English. All of a sudden, he started learning English. The thing that he thought was impossible suddenly became possible. And he still, he said he still had to work at it. It still took persistence and effort. But suddenly, because of his goal that he was passionate about, he had a reason for learning how to do this difficult thing, and he did. And for any of those who, you, those of you who have heard him speak publicly, you know that he's an amazing speaker in English. Obviously, he's mastered the English language, uh, speaks very fluently, very well. So he, this goal of his to become an aviator was the thing that gave him the motivation to learn to speak the English language well. Well, it's the same thing with family history. If we can center on the person's goals instead of, for instance, teaching our two-year family history class or um, making people do things our way, doing the sources exactly the way we want, if we focus on their goals, they're going to be so much more likely to build competence. So remember, I just that is the most important thing. Be sure that you're meeting, you know, and you're meeting that person's goals. Now, there are five things that we can do in addition to that, that will help build competence. The first is to build your own competence. Now, notice that I'm not saying be perfect. I'm not saying be an expert. I am saying continue to learn so that you are comfortable and you feel a level of, of competence that is growing as time goes on. And then you'll be much more comfortable helping people build their competence. Not the least of the, a, a reason, not the least of which is that you know how that person feels. So you, you're going through the experience of building your competence so you can empathize with what it's like for them to be building competence. It's not always easy. We don't want to mislead people and say, oh, yeah, piece of cake. No, sometimes it's hard, but we can do it. And that's the important thing. So build your own competence and you'll be better prepared to help others build theirs. The next important thing is do hands on. Most people learn so much better when they actually do something as opposed to when they just watch. Here's a simple illustration. Have you ever been the passenger in a car and you've driven maybe with somebody, I don't know, to a doctor's office or to a school or something, a university, and the other person's driving and you've been with them all the time, but you've never had to drive. So you sort of kind of know the way, but then one day that person is sick or something and it's your turn to drive yikes, I don't, I don't even know. I just, I, I haven't been paying attention. I trusted them to do the driving. So we learn so much better through experience rather than just observing or hearing about other people's experiences. So we will help people learn family history so much better if we create engaging experiences where they actually do their family history. That actually leads us to the next point, which is starting at the right level. Now, this is fundamentally different than dumbing down or cutting corners. When you dumb something down, you mislead somebody to think that something is easier than it really is. When you start at the right level, you're acknowledging that there are easy things and that there are hard things and that you're going to start with the easy things which are at the person's level and you're going to be building their competence as you go. So if you start at too high of a level, yeah, that's discouraging. But if you start at the right level where they feel, yes, I can do this, then they're much more likely to keep progressing. Another key thing is to explain things clearly and simply. Sometimes when we're 
advanced users or even intermediate users, we can forget what it's like to be a beginner. And so we might explain something and we think it's clear to us, but the other person doesn't have the context and the experience to make sense of what we're saying. So put yourself in the beginner's shoes. Remember when you were a beginner and do your best to explain things in clear, simple terms and to give them the context, the big picture that will help them make sense of what you're explaining. So an example of that is a census record. Probably a lot of us on the call have used census records before. And so they're kind of second nature to us. But to a person who's never used a census before and maybe doesn't even know what it is, they have no idea it's a count of population, they have no idea they're taken in regular intervals. If we just dive into an explanation of enumerators and districts and you know whatever, the person's like, huh? I have no idea what you're talking about. So it's so important to put yourself in their shoes Think what they would need to know and then explain those things clearly and simply and as part of the bigger picture. And then finally, welcome questions. Never make somebody feel like their question is stupid or that you don't want to hear it or you don't want to deal with it. I have heard teachers who have responded that way. I was in a class one time where someone asked a question and the instructor said, as I already told you, and it was about in that tone of voice. Do you think anybody else asked any more questions during that class? Nope. That effectively, effectively quashed all of our questions. We, we did not feel that they would be welcome. We did not feel that we'd be treated with respect if we had a question. But the thing is, questions are how people learn. Really, that's if you think about it in your own life, most learning is generated by your questions. They're, they're highly motivating because questions indicate gaps in your understanding and they're gaps that we as human beings want to fill. So encourage people to ask questions. Let them know that they're, the questions are welcome and, and you if you don't know the answer, you will do your best to find out. And that's the other thing. You don't have to be the perfect expert with all the answers to questions. Sometimes I think that's why maybe we don't welcome questions because we might not know the answer or we're afraid we might not. But if we take that worry off our list, you know what? Always there's going to be questions we can't answer. It's just part of life. So it's not anything to be embarrassed about. Just say to the person, that's a really good question and I don't know the answer, but I'd be happy to find out. And then both of you will learn something. Okay, those are thoughts on building competence, and we're now to the last part of the webinar today about delighting and inspiring people. How do we help them feel the joy? So to my surprise, one of the ways is to build competence, and in just a minute, I'll be sharing an experience that illustrates why that is the case. Another way is to be enthusiastic. Let your light shine through. Let people know with your eyes and your tone of voice how much you love family history. Also, express confidence in them. Let them know that you know they can do it, that you've been where they are, that no matter what stage they're at, if they're very beginning or they're a little past beginner, if you express confidence in them, that will do wonders for them feeling joy and feeling inspired to continue. Also, be a guide and a friend, not the quote expert. A lot of people Fortunately or unfortunately, I guess it could go either way, but they're put off by experts. And so if you're the guide and the friend, you're more approachable. So um, sometimes it's tempting for advanced users to maybe show off their knowledge a little bit or to fire hose people with too much information that they're not prepared to receive. So just keep in mind that, that when you help others learn to love and do family history, it's about them and their goals. It's not about you being the expert. So just be their guide and their friend, and that will go a long way towards helping them have positive family history experiences. 
be patient and flexible. So what I was thinking of when I when I created this little bubble is that it can be challenging sometimes for an experienced user to be patient with a novice user in a hands-on experience. One of my friends told me that she has to sit on her hands to keep from grabbing the mouse. And good for her that she realizes that and that she sits on her hands. So we just have to like let go of our drive to hurry through an experience and instead let the person take it at their pace and take it the direction that they want to go because that's going to provide such a better learning experience for them and it's going to be more of a joyful experience and then finally be respectful of their time nothing will turn well i shouldn't say nothing there aren't a lot of things that will turn people off family history more than going over time, like spending three hours at their home when really all they had was 45 minutes. So be respectful. I just ask people up front, how much time would you like to spend when we get together today? Most of the time they say an hour. And so when that hour mark comes, I go, unless they ask me to stay. If they ask me to stay, that's different. But I don't just assume that it's okay and go on for another hour or something that can that can turn people off family history so having said all those things what does this approach look like in real life so i want to share with you an experience i had just a couple of weeks ago at my church so the uh, the presidency of the women's group the, uh, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in my ward, my congregation, had asked me to teach a family history class to the women in the, in the ward. And so we talked about what we would do. And I, what it seemed that they were expecting was for me to get up and lecture and probably provide some motivational quotes, right? But I knew from past experience that that would not be effective. That would not be the most effective thing to do. And so I proposed to them that we choose somebody from the congregation, a sister in the congregation, and that we do a live discovery experience demo with her. And so I've done that in the past. And basically what we do is the other woman and I sit at the front of the class. She brings her laptop. We sit at a table and we cable her laptop to a big screen TV so that class participants can easily see what's going on. So that's what we did. We, we found a person who was willing to be um, part of the demo at the front of the class. And ahead of time, her name was Jody. And so ahead of time, I asked her, Jody, what is the thing that you would most like to do during this experience. And it turned out that she was pretty new to family history and family search. And so she said, I'd really like to learn the basics. Like she kind of tossed the question back at me. She said, I'm a new person. So what do you think I need to know as a new person to be successful doing family history? And I thought that was a great question. So that's how I prepared the, the, the discovery experience, the experience that we we're going to have in the classroom. So I got her permission to uh, be a helper, they call it, on Family Search, where I could see her tree as she sees it. And I discovered that her mom was living and her mom did not have her parents attached to her. But as I looked around, her parents were in, or her, excuse me, her grandparents, her mother's parents, were in Family Tree. Well, this comes up again and again with people, right? I'll bet a lot of you have had somebody say, my family's all missing and I know they're in family tree, but I don't see them. And it's usually because they're not connected to somebody who's living. And so I, in, as part of our discovery experience, I prepared to show her how to connect her grandparents to her living mother so that they would, so Jody would see the whole tree. And then the other thing is usually people want to know how to add people to their tree. And so I found a place where she could add some people based on some really simple English records. And that was the experience, just those two things. So on Sunday, we went in, we got everything set up, and we did the experience just as I described. 
here is the reaction that we got at the end of the experience. So for one thing, the audience was engaged. It was wonderful. They were all watching the big screen TV and they had lots of questions at the end, which showed that they were paying attention. And the whole reason for doing this actually was that afterwards, <laughs> and I'm embarrassed to say I forgot to do it this time, but normally when I do this kind of thing, I send around a sign up sheet afterward so people can sign up and we just say, if you'd like an experience, a guided experience like you just saw today, sign up on this sheet and we will get together with you and provide that experience. So we're still going to do that another time when we um, get back together for the women's meeting. But the other thing that happened, two other significant things happened. Afterwards, Jody was so excited. She she was joyful. She was delighted and inspired. She said, oh my goodness, this was so fun because we just showed her a few simple things and helped her build some competence. And she wants to get together again. She wants to keep building her skills. So that was fun. She Now she sees her whole tree. But also telling was the reaction from other people who just observed the demo. One woman came up afterwards talking to, to me and Jody, and she said, I never knew that family history could be so fun. Now, the interesting thing was I didn't really set out to make it quote and unquote fun. I set out to make it engaging, interesting, and competence building. But the sister who commented to us perceived that as fun. And I don't think that's unusual. I think people really have a sense of enjoyment and satisfaction when they see how doable family history really is. So that's an example of what it looks like in real life to design a learning experience or to create a learning experience that meets these three aspects right here. So everybody, that brings us to the end of our webinar today. Just by way of summary, we talked about things to avoid if we want to help others learn to love and do family history, guilt, just relying on motivation, having lessons that are too long or not practical, taking the random approach or misleading people by cutting corners or dumbing down family history, telling them it's easier than it really is. Uh, instead, on the other hand, we want to create learning experiences that meet people's stated goals and needs that help them build confidence and that delight and inspire them. So thank you so much for joining us for this webinar today. And Anna, do we have any questions that we need to address? Yes, um, several people would like um, um, either a handout or the slide set because um, they want to share with other people. Oh, absolutely. Let me just, I can dump that in the chat right now. Ah, uh, you know what I just realized? I don't know if I shared this. Let me, okay, I've got to get the Zoom menu out of the way here. And we'll go back to the authoring mode. And let me just make sure, oops, I blew that. I think I deleted a character I should not have deleted. Let me try that again, you guys. Thanks for your patience. OK, there we go. So let me just click the share settings and make sure whether I shared it or not. Changed anyone with the link. I didn't share it. So I'm really glad that somebody asked about that. So now it's accessible to anybody with the link. And let me just grab the link and I will put it in the chat. And I need to change it to everyone. You know what? Probably at least every other webinar, I send a message to everybody. And instead, I have my setting to hosts and panelists. And then nobody ever sees it. <laughs> so there you go, everybody. There's that link in the chat. And it should take you to the slide deck. Let me know if that doesn't work for any reason. Anna, any other questions that we should address? Yeah, um, Gerald had a great question, and I'm just going to alter it so it's uh, more applicable to um, 
more audience members, but so what do you do when the person you're looking for help a family history doesn't really know what they're doing? So is just to make sure I understand the question, are you saying that the person doing the helping doesn't yet know what they're doing or like they're a new consultant or something or that the yes. person they're trying to help? Okay, so if the person who wants to be a helper needs to get up to speed on being a helper, I would recommend that they look at our beginner class at the BYU Family History Library. So let me quickly go to that. Um, I'm going to Google BYU FHL Sunday classes. And if you scroll down, there is a virtual class archive. And if you go to that class class archive, and I will put the link to this also in the chat, just so it's handy. But if you're a new, if you're new to family history and you want to build your skills to help somebody, then I would recommend starting out with the Family Search Beginner Series. And it consists of these four classes and then a couple of kind of bonus classes. And once you've gone through that and you feel comfortable, then I would move on to the intermediate series. So I, that's probably where I would start. Another thing that I would do, a great place to get help is family search communities. So if you go to community.familysearch.org, there are all kinds of groups on here, uh, groups that focus on Temple and Family History consultants, if you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or uh, groups that focus on certain countries. So for instance, I saw just glancing at the chat, Polish research, or if you're interested in German research or Swedish or whatever, you can just search here. Let's do Poland, for example, and see what comes up. And so you get these results where people have been having discussions about Polish research, or they've um, provided links for Polish research, that type of thing. So let me throw in to the chat, the Zoom chat, the link to Family Search Communities. So that's another place that I would go, oh my goodness, okay, I just thought of something else that would probably be helpful to you. The other place that I would go, I am wondering if it's accessible on this menu. Okay, so I, go back to Family Search. It looks like it wasn't on the community menu, but if click search and then click research wiki. The thing about the research wiki, the thing to be aware of is it's not a place to find ancestors. So it's not a place with like, oh dear. I don't know if you guys can hear me, my internet seems to have like freaked out from the So the family search is not a place to find ancestors. In other words, it, it doesn't have census records in it. It doesn't have birth records. What it has is information about how to find those records. So for instance, let's say that I'm researching my family in Warwickshire, England. So I come to the wiki and I type Warwickshire, England. And then, okay, usually some auto hints come up, but they're not coming up. I don't know if it's because I'm having problems or it's because they've changed it. So I'm just, oh, there we go. It's just a little bit slow. So it will bring up some suggested pages that you can um, look for the information that you're interested in. I'm going to pick the first one here, Warwickshire England Genealogy. When I get over to that page, look at these amazing resources. So they give you websites that you can visit. They tell you the neighboring counties. They've got record types over here on the side. They've got some guided research. I mean, this is just amazing. The wiki is, in my estimation, one of the best tools for learning, especially if, you're, if you want to learn how to research in a specific location. But they also do have articles on 
general research strategies as well. So I hope that those three things might provide some good information for somebody who is wanting to build their competence so that they can help others with family history. Thank you for that great question. Anna, anything else? Nope, that's it. I think um, it just the comment about Poland is just kind of an extension of the original question. Okay, great. Then uh, that's it for today, and I'll turn it back over to you, Anna. Awesome, thank you. Um, I fixed the uh, the sign here, so that's all better now. Awesome. Um, and I, Catherine, I just wanted to thank you so much for that webinar. That was a much needed webinar for me um, as I struggled being motivated to do um, family history just because I don't know how to do it. Um, I'm glad it was helpful. Thank you. Anna. Yes, thank you. Um, and then thank you everybody else for joining us today. And um, I hope you'll join us for our next webinar, which will be on May 5th with James Tanner on what's new on ancestry.com. And a recording of this webinar will be made available next week. And you can do that on our YouTube channel or on our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at FHL underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.